Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard, and with me today, I have Ashley Kerr. Ashley, welcome back. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to come back again. This is your third time. You're one of few guests that have been on three times, so you're in, in good company there. I know we know each other a bit from our previous episodes and our mastermind, but for those who don't know your podcast, haven't heard our other episodes, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, I am the co-host of the Real Estate Rookie podcast. I've been doing that for a little over a year now, almost two years. And uh, I started investing in 2013. I was working as a property manager and that light bulb moment where he's doing this, I should be able to do this. So um, I actually partnered with the investor I was working for his son. We partnered together. Our last episode together was episode 49. And before that, we talked about on episode 22 for anyone that's interested in checking those out. But in our last episode, we talked about you're working on this property or this project that was kind of like commercial house hacking and you were doing it with a liquor store. So give us a quick rundown on what you had going on with that for those who didn't hear the previous episode and give us an update where you're at now. Okay. So I uh, purchased a four unit commercial building for $20,000. It sat vacant for years and I ended up gutting and rehabbing three units. Uh, one unit had a uh, a, it was a residential unit and had a tenant in place that wants to stay there forever. So we did um, plumbing updates for her and um, a couple small cosmetic updates. So we really didn't touch that unit much. And then we fully gutted and rehabbed the other residential unit and then rehabbed the two commercial units downstairs. Right now, uh, the property is fully rented. We have the two residential upstairs, and then we have a small clothing boutique that rents one of the commercial spaces. And then in the other space, I put in uh, a liquor store. So what really drew me to this building was that in this town, there was no liquor store. So there was the opportunity to put a liquor store in there, which is something I've wanted to do for several years now. And so the liquor store opened up in November of 2020. And so we've been open almost a year now. And uh, with this property, I loved it because it's a mixed use property and I'm getting several revenue streams from it. So I'm getting uh, residential rent, rental income. I'm getting commercial rental income. And then I'm also getting business revenue from the business that's operating in it. So that How was... Is uh, How's the liquor store doing? I remember at first it was, I don't want to say overwhelming, but you had a lot going on. You were, you know, you hadn't really had to deal with payroll before because that's not really a big issue a lot of times in these smaller real estate deals you've done. So how how is everything going with the actual liquor store business itself? Well, starting up was very overwhelming and getting it going. And we so my I have a partner on this and he actually owns a couple subway franchises and he has a supervisor that oversees these subway franchises. And so we pulled her on and we're like, we need your help with this because we know nothing about the day to day operations of a business. Even my partner, he relies so much on his supervisor. So we brought her in and that was amazing Her, I mean, just her setting up the POS system, her doing our first inventory order. Um, and then we actually found a, a manager. We looked at hiring somebody who had experience of managing a liquor store. And that's, it's very hard to find. Um, you know, there's not, it's not like there's a ton of, you know, liquor stores out there and people looking for jobs to be managers of liquor stores that have experience. So uh, what we did, we started looking at bars and restaurants of people who had experience managing a bar, doing the, the orders for the inventory for the bar. And we found uh, someone local that had worked in uh, several of the restaurants in the area, had experience being managers for those restaurants. And she is actually working for us as a manager and then also for uh, a restaurant right down the road road from the liquor store. So it's, it's working out well. But having her... Um, expertise of just knowing what wines are, what liquor is, has been uh, really great. And then just having her handle and manage the employees. So if there's, you know, an employee calls in and they can't, you know, come in that day, she takes care of it. Like we don't hear, we don't 
have to deal with any of that. And that was the biggest thing I wanted was I did not want to get the phone call like, hey, Ashley, you have to work in the liquor store today because the girl <laughs> called off work. I did not want that at all. And so having the supervisor and manager has worked out great. They do an awesome job together and it really makes it um, stress free and kind of very hands off uh, for me and my business partner. Eventually, once your kids are a little bit older, you'll be able to just send them down and make them work in the liquor store. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they already they already could use their help stocking shelves and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Once you got through those initial startup hurdles, how has it been in terms of profitability? I'm not sure if you had any expectations, but if you did, how has it compared to your expectations? And how does the profitability of a liquor store, an actual business, like a retail store, compare to that of say other types of real estate, not getting into the rental income itself, but just like the actual liquor store. How does that compare to rental properties and real estate? Okay. So it's not as profitable as I thought it was going to be in the first year. We've had more startup expenses than I imagined. Uh, so first of all, we um, are ready to expand. Like we've outgrown our space. So we're converting a garage that's next to it into uh, more storage for inventory. And we started off just being a, a regular liquor store. And then quickly we realized we needed to pivot and kind of incorporate like a boutique liquor store where we're having a lot of local wineries and um, distilleries be a main part of our inventory. But to do that, we had to expand to the garage. So that's kind of what we're working on now and putting money into building up that uh, garage uh, another hurdle we overcame was that the the big, huge front window was putting too much direct sunlight on the wine. So we recently just had to switch that window out with one that will block the the sun rays. And so we, you know, we went into this thinking like we completely rehab this uh, this unit. This is great. Like it's ready to go. And, you know, all these little things are coming up that we didn't realize for for having a liquor store. Uh, the difference with having a, a retail business compared to a real estate investing business is really the customer base. So I saw this a lot when I worked for the other investor um, who kind of brought me up into the investing world. He owned, uh, well, still owns auto dealerships. And then he had all of his rental property. And if there was an issue with a tenant, he firmly believed that it would affect the car sales. So he didn't want to, he didn't want to be a slumlord. He didn't want to be bad mouth. He didn't want to have a bad name in the community because that would affect his auto sales and his auto business. And that came first and that was a priority. And I watched how there was things that were, you know, the, a tenant would <laughs> demand these certain things and he would sometimes comply with it just because he didn't want them to like bad mouth him around town. And so I'll, I'm kind of seeing, like, I'm preparing myself for that. Um, if that does come up, like, how will I handle that? Because I have a lot of investments in this little town. The liquor store is there. And I don't, I mean, if someone starts to badmouth me because of something with their rental unit, like, it will spread through wildfire through this, you know, little tiny town. Um, so I think that's, like, a, a big thing that I've had to really be conscious of, of, how each business will reflect uh, upon each other. That reminds me so much of a, a saying Warren Buffett has. And that's what I think is kind of interesting about the perspective of real estate that I bring is that I my background is in stock investing. A lot of people that listen to the show know that. But I take a lot of stock investing principles and bring it to real estate. And one of those is Warren Buffett talks a ton about reputation and how he talks he talks about how he'd rather lose money any day of the week. He's fine with losing money on any deal. As long as you lose money, that's fine. Don't lose a shred of reputation. And he talks about that because his reputation has got him so many deals. And we're talking in this case about not hurting existing deals, but Buffett has talked about how his reputation has led to him being able to acquire other companies at lower prices than a competitor just because of his reputation and people wanted to work with him. And so it sounds like this this guy, this businessman investor has taken a, a similar philosophy and it's being passed down to you. Yeah, I, I, that's such a great point. I, I love that you just shared that with me. Um, but yeah, it, and I think there's also like that fine line too as to 
you being too um, easy to work with where you people can walk all over you too, because I have seen um, that side of it too. So that's, that's something where I'm trying to, to balance so that I don't get into that position either. How has this made you think about diversification? Have you considered, you know, like, ah, maybe I have too much in this one little area because of, I mean, this could be one of the examples. There could be a, a bunch of different reasons, but have you, has it made you think about maybe expanding to other markets even more than you already have if you have? Yeah. So right now I'm just in the, the Buffalo area, the South towns of Buffalo, all, all of my real estate is there, but definitely the, the liquor store was a, a large reason, uh, or a reason for me to start was to diversify more portfolio. I mean, he has a liquor store too. He has auto dealerships. He has an insurance agency, all these different businesses. And then he has commercial property, residential property. And what I've watched over the years is him pull money or equity from one business and, you know, maybe put it towards a remodel on another business or used it to purchase another business. That was where I saw like the the real value in having multiple streams of income. So if one stream is not doing well, you can still rely on the other ones. And that was kind of like with my commercial building too. So if all of a sudden commercial, you know, nobody wants retail on a, a main street anymore. It's just dead. I still have the residential units to support the commercial and vice versa. No one wants to rent in this town anymore. I still have the commercial units. So um that was a, definitely a big factor of me wanting to diversify. Buffett also talks quite a bit about how being an investor helps him be a better businessman and being a better businessman helps him become a better investor. And what I like about the liquor store is story and your strategy is that you didn't just go out and rent or lease a space for the liquor store. You said, I'm a real estate investor. Let's make me be a real estate investor. Help me become a better business owner. And in this case, you bought the the liquor the property to do the liquor store in and whatever the profitability is on the liquor store, come five, 10 years from now, you're going to have this property. Maybe it's paid off. Maybe you have a ton of equity in it. And that's probably going to be significant, especially considering what the liquor store does in profits. And so I see another parallel here between, because you're a real estate investor, you're also able to be a better business woman. Yeah. So we had intended to um, charge rent to the building. So a big part of it too, was kind of shifting the the income so obviously the the liquor store being a retail store we're gonna you know be taxed at a higher tax bracket um where uh, the property we're getting a lot more tax advantages from that property and getting taxed at a lower tax bracket on that rental income so what we've done is try and shift as much of that revenue to the property away from the liquor store uh, so, for example, my partner and I both have the same ownership equity in the building and the liquor store. So the liquor store is on a triple triple net lease. So the liquor store is paying the insurance, they're paying the real estate taxes, and they're paying for any repairs or maintenance, which is going to reduce the, you know, the, the gross income or the net income on that property and or on that business. And then our income will be a little bit higher on the rental property because we're deflecting a lot of those expenses through using a triple net lease. If someone listening to the show has seen a similar property, I know in my area, I've seen similar properties. There's commercial, maybe on the first floor, residential above it, but they weren't sure maybe what residential tenants would feel, how they would feel about living above a commercial space or even near a commercial space, whatever the structure is. How have your residential tenants felt about it? Uh, we have not had any complaints at all. Um, I I think we have like very quiet businesses though below. It's not like there's loud music playing or it's a bar or anything like that. So I think that definitely makes a difference, but there has been uh, no issues at all. Um, if anything, the, the girls that work down in the liquor store can sometimes hear the one guy in his apartment talking if he's like standing in one corner with a vent is or something, <laughs> but I, that's really like the only issue of of having them. But um, yeah, I, if anybody is thinking of starting a business, I would highly recommend looking at a property to purchase. This property, we got it for $20,000 and I probably never would have bought it if I didn't know I was going to put a business in it because I didn't know what who would want to rent it or what to go into it. and. So I, I 
took a risk on this vacant building. And so as $20,000, we put about 70,000 of rehab into it. So all in 90,000 and it ended up appraising for $220,000. So already right there was just a huge advantage, um, having that much equity in it already. I think normal house hacking, residential house hacking for a, an individual investor is super, super powerful. And then when I heard about this idea of, I kind of call it commercial house hacking. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but Let's I learned coin it. <laughs> yeah, we'll coin it. Commercial, commercial house hacking. So a friend of mine had told me probably a year or two ago that his dad did this before I'd ever heard of it. And he said that his dad bought like an 18 unit uh, commercial building and he ran a construction company out of it. And basically all the other units allowed his business to have no rent. So that was great. That gave him a competitive advantage in the construction industry. And then 20 years or so went by and he was sick of the construction business. He's like, I just don't want to do this anymore. It's labor intensive. So he actually sold the construction business, but kept the property. The property was all paid off almost exclusively from the tenants. Now he had this commercial property that's bringing him like $50,000 a month in pure profit. And wow. now he's just does that. And yeah. you know, it's just so, so amazing. I love house hacking. And the fact that you can do a commercial is, is awesome as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think there there's a lot of different opportunities out there. And that's what I love about real estate is there's no one set way to do it. There's so many different strategies you can use. I mean, I'm using an RV to do yeah. Airbnb <laughs> yeah, short term rentals, right? I mean, there's so <laughs> many, there's so many ways that you could do you could do real estate. It's one of the things I love about it too. Yeah. Now, even though there is a lot of different ways you can do real estate, a lot of gurus say that you shouldn't do a lot of different things. They say you should really focus and, and master one thing. But I know you do a few different things, commercial, you do long-term rentals, I think you do some short-term rentals, maybe some flipping. I know you do a bunch of different stuff. So how do you think about this dynamic of really focusing on one strategy versus doing a bunch of different stuff? I think that when you're first starting out, it's very important to hone in and get one skill set, one strategy down in one niche. So when I started out, it was duplexes. That's what I was buying. That's what I was working on. That's I I put in offers now on single family and duplexes without even going to look at the property just because I I know what I'm looking for. I know what I want. I know how, what the ARV is going to be. I know what the rehab cost will be. And I know what the, the area is. And I just have this strategy so honed down that it's easy to me. But that also makes me bored, I guess, because it's so easy to do that, that strategy for me that um, I've looked at different things the last couple of years. And the, the four unit was like the first full gut rehab I have done. And um, so making that transition, it was a lot of work, but I learned a lot. And then I bought um, a foreclosure single family house that needed to be gutted and learned a lot on doing that rehab. And and then we actually ended up flipping it and not even keeping it. So the last year, year and a half has definitely been like a shiny object for me, chasing after different things. I started a Airbnb, do an Airbnb arbitrage. And so I think it's really important to focus and get like that foundation built using one strategy. And then it's okay to, you know, pivot and divert and maybe try a couple things and then see what really interests you. A lot of podcasts seem to really just focus on wins and they don't really talk about struggles or losses. And I think there's a lot of value in that. So I want to chat a bit about what you're struggling with right now in your business. What is it that you're struggling with and how are you working through those challenges? Well, I have I actually have a perfect example of that because I am struggling through something right now. I uh, so I it would be about six weeks ago. I put an offer in on a self storage facility. So it's uh, like 36 units self storage and then three commercial buildings. And one of those buildings is a mechanic repair, a service shop. Uh, so I did the uh, the offer as seller financing uh, with a down payment. But the seller financing terms were not great. It was only amortized over 10 years, a balloon in five. So I knew that I wanted to refinance out of this property um, as soon as possible, but I um, it was easier for me to get into it doing the seller financing, putting a, a smaller down payment. So um, I got it under contract um, and I started my due diligence and the original contract set a two week due diligence. So I did a phase one. 
well, with, when that phase one was happening, the environmental study, the person that was doing it, the third party, when they went there, the owner was supposed to give them access to the whole property. Well, they could not get into one building. So then we had to ask for an extension because we were delayed and the, the, the environmental lady, she had to go back again. So this kind of pushed us out like a, a month at this point before we got the phase one report back. Well, then the phase one report back came and said that they recommend doing a phase two. So I kind of, I did delay a little bit. I took a couple days and like, okay, what should I do? Should I go forward with it? I actually had, um, uh, I was speaking at a, a conference and a bunch of my real estate friends were going to be there. So I pretty much spent the whole weekend like, what should I do? And picking their brains and there's pay for it. And if the phase two comes up that there's issues, even if they agree to remediate it, don't go forward with the project. Like, kill the deal. You don't want anything with environmental issues. Walk away. So I uh, was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. My broker negotiated with the sellers. The sellers said, yes, we will pay for the phase two because it was going to be $6,500. And I had already dumped $3,000 into the, the initial phase one. And they said, we will pay for the phase two if it fails. If it passes, we want Ashley to, to pay for pay for it then, which was fine with me because that meant the deal would go through and I was just you know putting money into my, my due diligence period and I was still getting the deal. Well, uh, yesterday I got an email from my attorney saying that they no longer were going to extend my due diligence period and not allow me to do a phase two. And I had to decide by Friday if I was going to put down my down payment and continue to uh, close on the property without a phase two. So I got that ultimatum. Uh, so I talked to my broker last night and he talked to uh, the, the broker of the selling agent. And he said the selling agent misspoke, like he never should have said they would pay for the phase two and then they would extend it. And so now there's feels like there's something weird going on. Like maybe they're using this as an opportunity to pull out of the contract because they have a, another offer or something. But I have until Friday to decide. I'm pretty sure that I won't go forward with the deal um, unless they extend my due diligence period because I don't want to purchase the property without having that all clear from the phase two. And before I even put in my offer on this property, I talked to a bank about refinancing and made sure that I could refinance and what I needed from them. So they actually connected me with an approved third party um, environmental um, study place or whatever uh, to make sure that this was all in place. But um, yeah, so that's kind of that's like what I'm struggling with right now. I already dumped out three grand into this deal and then I have to walk away from it. Is that the total amount that you have on the line is the three grand if you back out? Yeah. So that's what I paid for the phase one environmental study, but also my time into the deal already. I mean, I've done uh, all my due diligence research on the property, you know, going through the leases, um, looking at the tax records, doing, you know, all that and putting my offer in, negotiating my offer in, in my broker's time too into the deal. I mean, if this deal dies, he gets nothing out of it. I think that you're you're probably aware of this, but I would think of the sunk cost fallacy. I know it sucks to lose three grand and all the time, but for myself, if I was in that situation, and I think I can probably think about it a little bit clearer because I'm not in the situation. And I know if I was, I'd be very biased, but I would really just try to think about sunk costs. It's like, I've already spent all that time. I've already done all, put the money into it. It is what it is. If I buy a bad deal, it doesn't make it any better. You know, I don't get that money back and all that. I just lose more money and it just gets worse. And I mean, it sounds like your your other real estate friends were very set on you know no environmental issues. So if you move forward and there is an environmental issue, I mean, you're kind of stuck, you know, against the one big thing they said not to do. Right, exactly. And then I can't get bank financing unless I remediate it, and who knows how much that would cost. And um, yeah, so I uh, I I'm unless for some reason they decide to extend my due diligence period. I uh, and can do the phase two, then I will do the phase two at least probably to see and, you know, put some more money into it. But um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I would rather lose three grand than walk into a bad deal for sure. 
was it not set in a contract or in writing that they were going to be the seller was going to be willing to pay for the phase two study? Yeah, that was not in the contract at all. It was just that I had um, a two week due diligence period to do a phase one study and there was nothing in the contract. So that's something my broker and I talked about last night, too, was like, OK, how would we prevent this into the future? So instead of putting in a timeline, um, because actually initially I asked for a four week due diligence period and in their counter offer to me, they narrowed it down to two weeks. But I think going forward, the lesson learned to me was that instead of putting a set timeline, I should put, um, you know, a phase one and if applicable, a phase two study will be performed based on the third party's timeline or something like that, because I, I can't control when the, you know, the phase two people can come out and do the actual study and do their their site visit. You mentioned that the other the seller's broker mentioned he shouldn't have said that they would cover it and et cetera. So it sounds like that was more of like a verbal agreement that they would cover it if it failed and you would have to cover it if it passed, but it was actually never put in writing. Is that how that it was put in writing in a text message from the listing agent to my broker? And then they spoke verbally over it on the phone. And then my broker had emailed it to me and saying, what about what do you think about doing this? And that's when I had emailed my attorney and said, hey, can you add this to the contract and get their attorney to agree? So um, that's why we think something happened between then and there, because the sellers had told their listing agent go ahead. And but it was the the seller agent's uh, boss, the broker that actually called last night to to say that, no, they weren't going to do that anymore. So your attorney sent it to their attorney and their team to get it actually signed off on and make it finalized. But it actually, it, they pushed back and said, hey, we're actually not yeah. going to do this. Yeah, yeah. Why were your real estate colleagues so against buying a property with environmental issues? Is it just because of how costly it can be and how you just really have no idea what it could entail? Uh, one thing they mentioned to me was um, the chain of ownership. So even 20 years from now, if I sold that property and there's three different owners, if for some reason it wasn't, you know, remediated correctly or that there was other environmental issues or whatever, somebody could come back on me as an owner from so long ago and um, I would I would be liable uh, on that property. So um, I think there's so many issues that can come up. This is a great example of a realization that I've come to over the last year or so. And that realization is that I think real estate books are great. That's not the realization. The realization is that the books are great, but there's a ton of stuff that happens in real estate when you're actually involved in it that isn't covered in books. And it's not really the the fault of, of the author. There's so many different things that could happen. You couldn't possibly cover everything in a book. And that's why I actually, I created a platform called Investor Shadow. If anybody's interested, you can check it out at investorshadow.com. But Similar to the story we just talked about, what are parts of real estate that you see are often missed in books and other edu- educational resources that actually happen in real world real estate? Well, I think a lot of it is um, someone face to face with you is going to be a lot more blunt and to the point and matter of fact than if you're reading their book because you're you're reading their book, they're probably gonna try and tailor it to a lot of different situations and a lot of different people um, without kind of stepping on anyone. And that that's not always the case, but um, if you're talking to someone face-to-face and telling them the situation, you're gonna get um, a lot better uh, f- feedback and probably a lot more uh, straightforward. So that's why I love the, the networking and making those connections and being able to have those people to even just talk something out. So uh, a couple of things that, you know, I didn't expect or think in real estate was the first thing was I thought when I first purchased my property was that you had to buy cash. You had to use cash for an investment property. I had that limited mindset. Um, And I think there's, and obviously I bought properties doing no money down, creative financing, you know, seller financing, uh, private money, like so many different ways. And I think that um, having a a limited mindset about certain things, even if you read it in a book, like that it's different, that you can actually do something a different way. 
it's not the same as someone telling you directly and like looking at you, believing in you, like, actually you can do it this way because the, with social media and everything online, sometimes it's hard to actually believe anything in writing. <laughs> We've talked about your struggles and some of the things that are hard in real estate, but I want to talk about the flip side now. What's going well in your real estate business? What are you proud of that you're succeeding at? Uh, well, the first thing is I started a, a real estate rookie to to help her, her next deal, and it's it's through Bigger Pockets, and I have run it um, two times now. We're in like our second session, but. I am so proud of the people that have joined it and taken action on it and like the emails and things that I get, uh, you know, just it, they're so inspiring to me. And I I feel so grateful that I get to to be a part of helping these people get started in real estate because it's really changed my life as far as um, actual real estate investing. I so the self storage facility and the um, I have a mobile home park under contract too. Both of those are over a quarter million dollar deals, or I'm sorry, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar deals. And I, uh, before that, I never purchased a house more than a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Like my houses are the cheapest was seventeen thousand. The most expensive was a hundred and fifty thousand. And I think that um, I'm proud of myself for making that mindset shift. Like. I can do that. I can get that deal done, um, except for the self storage, which might fall apart. But I, I am very proud of myself that I'm, I'm not limiting myself um, to to smaller deals. That I'm open to to looking at different opportunities and to to growing on a, a larger scale. And you're doing a bunch of different types. You did the, the commercial yeah. and the liquor store and mobile home park now and also self storage. I mean, I think I think that's awesome and definitely something to be proud of. Thank you. For those people that are in your boot camp or people listening to this show that have done no deals or just one or two deals, where do you see the best opportunities for new investors? It's definitely house hacking. So if you have the opportunity to house hack um, and you can live in one unit and rent out the other units or you can, um, you know, rent out the other bedrooms or you can park an RV in your driveway and live in the RV and rent out the house because that's still your physical mailing address <laughs> to get a, a nice loan on that. But um, yeah, I think house hacking is definitely the best way. If not, it's starting or working with another investor and seeing what they're working on and see if that's a strategy you'll actually like to do. So a lot of people say, oh, well, I'll do wholesaling first because you don't need a lot of money to get started and stuff. But wholesaling is not always that fun. And you have to kind of be a certain type of person to actually enjoy it, especially if you're going to be doing all the phone calls yourself. You're going to be doing all the appointments yourself. You're going to be out finding buyers and trying to you know, sell deals. It's a lot of work. Um, so I think being able to get that experience or talk with people who are doing the different strategies um, can really help you decide. But think about the life you want five years from now, 10 years from now, and pick the strategy that works around that. You can always pivot, you can always change it, but right now, what's something that um, you would enjoy too? So it's not always what's gonna make you the most money the quickest, but um, what will fit into the life you want to. Outside of all of the different real estate and business adventures we've just been talking about, you also co-host one of Bigger Pockets podcasts, the Real Estate Rookie Podcast. And we haven't talked about this yet on either of our past episodes together, but I know a lot of people are interested in learning about how they might be able to get an opportunity like that, whether it's with Bigger Pockets or here at TIP, because we're actually hiring a new host or a different company, whatever the situation is, something like what you or I have. How does someone go about getting a chance at an opportunity like this? How can someone really try to stand out? Well, I can say how it happened for me, but I started an Instagram to talk about my real estate investing journey. And I kind of put myself out there sharing my failures, my successes, and what I was doing to invest in real estate, but more specifically how I was doing it. Uh, so I think that made a difference was I wasn't just like, oh, here, look at me. I bought another property. It was like, 
this is exactly how I bought the property. This is where I got the money from. This is how I negotiated the contract and doing different things like that. So I actually was on the Bigger Pockets podcast before uh, I was a host and I had been found on Instagram. And then uh, Bigger Pockets had put out an announcement just like you have that they're hiring, uh, you know, they want to start a new podcast and they're hiring uh, two people to co host. And so I just submitted an application and then I went through a round of interviews. Um, but I I think that I, I really wanted it and I was really determined. And my co-host at the time, Felipe Mejia, they actually matched us up together to interview together and they would they were picking a set of people to come on and we were paired up together. And I mean, we practiced interviewing people constantly. Like we would have our friends pretend to be guests and we'd go on Zoom calls and practice interviewing them. And then we had like our our final interview and we had to submit an interview to them for them to, to look at. And then they decided on us. But I think putting yourself out there and social media is amazing for networking and connecting with other people. If I wouldn't have started my Instagram account, I wouldn't probably be here today because nobody would know who I was or or what I was doing. And sometimes like, yes, that can be a super nice thing, like not having to deal with anyone or talk to anyone or, you know, just kind of living in the shadows. But um, but then you, you might miss out on some opportunities. And I think there's a lot of people that don't realize what opportunities just having social media accounts can do for you if you're really putting your time and effort into it. And I speak from experience because before I started this podcast, I had no social media. I didn't have any account. I had like one little small Facebook account with some friends and family. Like that was it. I, I hated social media. And so I I got lucky because Stig and Preston, mostly Stig, who founded the Investors Podcast, hated social media. So he wasn't looking for somebody that had a big social media following. So it kind of just worked out in my favor. But I've seen, even in my own experience now, your experience and others, you get a lot of opportunities from social media. And so whether you hate social media or not, it's a, it's a very valuable tool that you could use to build your personal brand that can lead to opportunities. And the other piece is you've put in a lot of hard work to get that position. And so I think that's the big key takeaway that a lot of people can learn is it's going to take a lot of hard work and you got to put in a lot of work if you really want to stand out. Yeah. And I didn't, e and honestly, I didn't even have that big of a following. I had started my Instagram account in June and then I was hired in December and I maybe, maybe had a couple thousand, maybe like 3000, maybe something. So don't think that like you have to, you won't have an opportunity until you have a large following. If you're putting out good content, people are going to notice and you're going to, you're going to grow quickly. Um, but I think that um, if somebody is really determined, like be persistent. Um, I, when I went to, after I'd been on the Bigger Pockets podcast uh, with David and Brandon, I'd gone to this conference and I knew the producer of the show was going to be there. And I, we sat and talked for a while, connect. I like made sure that I talked to him at that conference. We just made that, you know, connection, that face to face. And I think that really helped too um, when I actually went to interview for the position that we had that kind of rapport already from from meeting in person. So anybody that wants to be your co-host, find out what conference you're going to and then stalk you at the conference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you did you know that there was the position coming when you went to talk to no, the producer? No, I didn't I didn't know. Yeah. But I just knew that I wanted to to keep that relationship with him. Yeah. And that's why I asked because that's so valuable. You you didn't know that this position was right. coming, right? You just were networking and you knew yeah. By doing these things, there could be value down the line. And there's been so many things that I've done in my life over the last couple of years that I had no idea that what I'd done in the past was going to lead to what I'm doing now. And you just, you can't connect the dots going forward. There's a saying, you can't connect the dots going forward, but you can looking back. And it's so true. You just have no idea what is going to lead to what opportunities. Right. We've talked a bit about what new investors should do. We talked about what you're doing in your business. We talked about what you're doing with bigger pockets. What are you doing next? What is your and what is your end goal? So <laughs> I struggle with this so much. <laughs> I I so I actually figured out like a year ago because I always struggled with my why because my kids like, yes, they're my why. But it wasn't like big enough to me. Like that was way too obvious. So I came up with the word spontaneous. Like I just want to have a spontaneous life. I want to be able to wake up and do whatever I want. 
So I've gotten really close to having that, to getting to that, um, where really the only things that I have to, to schedule out are um, podcast recordings, but I love to do that. So that's like super fun for me. I think the the next big thing is that I I need to I really need to figure out as to like what's my number? What's it going to be where I'm like okay, everything from this point is passive, no hands-on, like I'm I'm getting to that that big passive number any anything new um where I have to physically work in the business or work on the business where maybe it's just throwing money into syndication deals or things like that. So um, I actually met with uh, James Daynard uh, a couple weeks ago in Seattle, a, a awesome guy there that's built multiple businesses and he has a hard money business and does lending out of that. And that I've done a little bit of that, like on a really small scale working for this other investor, I've managed a little tiny lending company for him. And I, I think that really intrigues me as to like, that would be the next step for me in a couple of years is to getting to that point where I'm doing, um, some hard money loans. So that's what intrigues me. A <laughs> similar... I still get to analyze the deals and, you know, people bring them to me and I get to help people get started in real estate or continue to grow their portfolios. So I like that a, side of it. A similar idea to what you mentioned about being spontaneous that I just learned about this morning was I was listening to another podcast and the host is somebody that I tend to look towards for, I don't know him personally, but I, I really follow like what he does online and things like that. I think he's a really smart guy. And he talked about one of his long-term goals is designing or designing his life so that he has his perfect Tuesday. And what he means by that, the perfect Tuesday is because Tuesday is just it's every other day of the week, right? There's nothing special about a Tuesday. It's not Friday. It's not the first day of the week. There's nothing special not about hump Tuesday. Day. <laughs> yeah, it's not hump day, right? It's just Tuesday. Yeah. And so he says, what can I do? How can I design my life to make the perfect Tuesday? What, what can I do to make any general day the perfect day for me so that I'm only doing the things that I want to be doing on that day? And so that's that's kind of like what I'm working on too. And it sounds like you're working on on something similar. Yeah. And the, like one thing I really like is flexibility. So I have been traveling a lot and I went to um, this past spring, I went to support a, a real estate investor friend who was doing a 50K ultra marathon. And a, a bunch of us went and the the day before I was supposed to leave, a bunch of them were going to Boise, Idaho to, to visit my friend's self-storage business there. And that night, me and three other people were like, well, we want to go too. And we just booked it. And I went there for four days and it was like, this is so cool that I can do that. Um, so I think being able to, to have that flexibility and that freedom, um, is really enjoyable. And then just, I need to get to the point where I can, uh, have a, a, a nanny that comes and travels with me, not for vacations or anything like that, because me and the kids do great with that, but for conferences and stuff so that when I actually have to go and speak, there's somebody to watch them. And then the rest of the time we can go do whatever. So uh, I'm speaking at a C Rosenberg's Orlando mastermind in October. And so my mom is coming and it's like, cool, I get to fly her down and she gets a little vacation and gets to hang out with the kids that she loves. And then we'll all do stuff when I'm not speaking. So. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really all about designing the life that you want. It's not about necessarily having the most money, but but the designing right. of the life yeah. that you want. And I think a lot of it is like managing your money too. So, I mean, I, I'm i not super wealthy yet. <laughs> and I I mean, I strive to be, but it I'm I the money that I do have, I use it to reinvest to generate more money or I'm doing I do a ton of travel hacking. Like my mom's flight was free. To Florida because I had enough points and I I tried to use my money towards things that I will enjoy more towards experiences than things and we you know kind of our family has made that kind of mindset shift the last couple of years too as to focusing more on where our money is actually going and on making our money work for us but also more of experience than things if I had to define probably the biggest change or 
biggest area of growth that I've had over the last, I don't know, five, six years has been that mindset shift from trying to be ultra wealthy, just like ridiculously rich to being what Ramit Sethi would call is your rich life and designing the life you want. Because when I was growing up, like 18, 19, like even early days of college, I just wanted to be filthy rich. Like to be completely honest, that's all I cared about. I wanted to be a billionaire. I, that's all I wanted. I was actually like in my high school class, you know, they have superlatives, like nicest eyes or best smile or whatever. I was voted most likely to be a billionaire. And it was just like who I was. And then yeah. Over the last five years or so, I've just really changed that. Like, I realized that those guys don't really have, they have a lot of money, but they don't have a lot of time. And a lot of times they're not necessarily doing what they want. They're so busy doing everything else that they have to do to have that money. And so I think for me, I'd rather have a little less money or a lot less money and be able to do whatever I want whenever I want. And so that's been a huge shift for me. It sounds like you've kind of gone through a, a similar shift. Yeah. And I think that when you get to that point where you can live comfortably with, you know, and still travel and do things that you want and having a lot of time, there's actually going to be other opportunities that come to you that may generate more money because you're open to these opportunities and you may not even have to do that much for it. Where if you were focused on, you know, the day to day of, of doing building this billion dollar company, you may miss out on these other opportunities. Um, so I, yeah, I think that having a lot of time is not just valuable to you and your family, but I think it will open your eyes and open doors for you for all different kinds of opportunities and things like that. Have you found that living the life you want to live, the, the spontaneous life or just designing your life in the way you want, have you found that it's actually more attainable? And I guess you could say cheaper than you expect. And the reason I ask that is because Sure. It's going to cost a lot of money, right? The things we're talking about travel, it's not cheap. Not everybody can do it. I understand that. But at least for me, when I was, like I said, when I really wanted to be rich, I wanted to be rich, not because I cared about the money, but because I wanted a lot of different things. And then I had somebody sit me down one time doing exercise, like map out everything I wanted in life. And it was a lot of money, but it was like not even close to what I thought I needed. And so even for me now, I'm nowhere near wealthy in terms of what I want to be. But I'm starting to realize like even the biggest things that I want in life are like not that expensive relative to yeah. what I thought I needed. Like it's so much more attainable than I thought, you know, and I'm curious if you've had a similar experience. Well, I think that we have the same mindset on this is where we can look at something and figure out a way to generate income off of it. So, for example, <laughs> you know, your uh, your RV that, you know, you wanted an RV and you're you're making money off of it and probably going to have it for free and never putting your own money into it. And I think that I've I've had that realization, too, is to, you know, I've always wanted, you know, a, a, an RV. I've always wanted a boat, like, a, you know, a super nice car. Whether it is all of those things, you can rent it out on Turo. You can rent it out on Motorhome on Outdoorsy. You can rent boats out on, you know, different apps, too. So I think a lot of these things that people want is you can actually, you know, make money off of them, too. So it's not even being able to afford them. It's that you, a lot of times you can get these things for very little money by giving up some time with them. And who actually owns a boat and uses it every single day anyway? <laughs> so, but That is um, so, so well said. And there's a lot of things I don't like about being born in this generation. I often joke, I wish I was born in like the 50s or 60s, but there's yeah. a lot of things that I do like, right? These opportunities we have today are just I mean, it's uh, essentially unlimited and yeah. I'm very thankful for those opportunities. But I, I was the same as you where I thought of all these things I would want and like, you know, the expensive clothes, nice handbags. And I mean, I've never been like a, a big bag person or whatever, but, I, you know, it just the nice things and having a nice big house. And I mean, now I'm like, I probably will never move out of my house. I don't want a bigger house. And I... Uh, Maybe I, would, I, but I would rather get three other houses across the country where I can Airbnb them when I'm not there and then go and visit them whenever I want. But also I was sitting in uh, Las Vegas probably about a year ago and I was just kind of contemplating my life and just thinking about like how far I've come, um, especially compared to like the first time I ever went to Vegas, like how it was such a different experience for me. And I was thinking like, cause I remember the first time I was ever there, like walking through all the shops and just like, wow, everything is so expensive and looking at everything and how I'd love to just 
you know, go through there and have a shopping spree one day or things like that. So I sat on this this bench inside one of those malls uh, last year and I was just thinking like, okay, I, I want to treat myself. What would I buy? What, what should I get is like just a, a treat for me. And I sat there and I could not think of anything that I actually really wanted inside of any of those shops. So instead, I just took a boatload of money and I put it into index funds in my Vanguard account. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so much more happy now. <laughs> but that was just like such a weird moment for me that I didn't even want anything. I mean, sure, if anybody wants to buy me something super nice and expensive, go ahead. But I just, I don't have the desire anymore. I've literally gone through the exact same <laughs> realization myself. It's like, it just now that I can kind of buy a lot of the things right. that I want, I just, yeah. just don't really need to. It's like yeah. almost, I think it's kind of, the, I think we talk about, like a lot of people talk about this in relationships, right? Like you really like somebody when you're chasing them and then you you start dating and it's like, oh, you know, it kind of fades away because it's about the chase, not like yeah. actually what you have. And so for me, I think it's kind of the same with like the stuff is it was just the chase of being able to get those things. And now that it's like, oh, I can actually get them. It's like, eh, I don't really want them anyway. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Gary V actually talks about this a lot. He He has this goal for anybody that doesn't know Gary. He has this goal of buying the New York Jets. And he's very publicly talked about this for dec probably a decade now. And he often says, like, listen, don't be surprised if one day I wake up and I can actually buy the Jets and I say, meh, I don't want to. Like, I just, it's been the journey. I've, I've loved the journey of trying to get to buy the Jets. And if one day I don't actually buy them because I decide I don't want to anymore, then don't be surprised. And yeah. it's just the same concept that we're talking about. I was talking to your co host, Tony, before the show. And I told him this, and I want to tell you the same is this next segment of the show is called our action plan. And it was actually inspired by you guys uh, on your show. I really like your show and you guys have a lot of different segments of the show. And, and here on my show, I didn't have any segments. I just went through interview questions with a guest. That was pretty much it. But I really liked what you guys do with your show uh, between you, you and Tony. And so I decided to add this segment. It's called the action plan. And the reason I, I created this is because I think too many people listen to podcasts and books and, and things and don't take action on, on anything they're learning. They just continue to consume and consume. And I know I was one of those people and I really want people to actually take action on what they're learning. So together, we're going to create an action plan from this episode. And the first question is, what habit or principle do you follow in your life that has had a big impact on your success that not enough people do, but should? I would say one thing is that it, I do every day is I pick at least three things that I need to get done for that day. And I may, I my to do list is never ending. Like it's forever long. And I probably, I have multiple of them. I think I, I have a paper one right here. I have one in my phone. <laughs> I have all my emails to get to, but I pick at least three, some depending on the day, maybe more. And at, if I get those things done, I feel great at the end of the day that I accomplished those things and I knocked them off my list. And it can be something as simple as a phone call that I've been dreading or procrastinating and just getting it done. It just feels so much better. Like, even if I only did those three things, I don't know what it is about it, but just set, making sure that I get at least a couple things done because or else I'll have 50 tabs open on my computer. I'll be, you know, having texts. Instagram messages, I'll be, you know, doing stuff with the kids and just, I will feel like I get nothing done. So as long as I pick those things at the beginning of the day and I knock them off and sometimes I'll even time block for them too. Like if it is a little bit longer of something, um, I'll actually time block it into my calendar. So I think just uh, for anybody just starting out, just think of, you know, what are a couple things you could do each day to, to knock off your list. I do the exact same thing, literally the exact same situation for me. My to-do list yeah. is endless, but yeah. I follow this strategy. It's called the power list. And anybody that follows me on social, anybody that follows me on social knows that I talk about the power list a bit. And it's the same idea, but it's five things. Every day you have to do, there's five main things you have to do. As long as you get those things done, you quote unquote, win the day. Mm -hmm. And you know, it could be three, it could be two, it could be five, you know, whatever your number is, uh, that's your first step in the action plan is every day. For if, if you're listening to the show, that's your first step is to define three to five things that you have to get done every day and don't let everything else overdo everything else on your to-do list overtake your day. 
and it's not even it has to be real estate specific it could honestly be hey calling the doctors and setting up your child's doctor's appointment like any can be anything in your day to to make it a win for you for the second action step for someone listening to the show is to go read a book that you're going to recommend and i want you to recommend your most influential book that you've read and it doesn't necessarily have to be your favorite because i think sometimes favorite and influential are different so what has been your most influential book or most impactful book that you've read um i'm gonna say two and you probably have the one of these on your your podcast a lot but uh one the first one is the simple path to wealth i love that book because it's just very eye-opening and it's like, wow, it really can be that simple. And it's not even really about real estate investing. It's just investing in general and how it's easy just for somebody to become, you know, wealthy or a millionaire by doing a couple simple steps. And I, I'm a huge believer in having great financials and knowing how to manage your money. It's not about how much money you have. It's about knowing how to manage the money you do have. Uh, so I, I love that book. And then um, the second one is Hug Your Haters by Jay Bayer. So it's a, actually a customer service based book and it's a, a based a lot on social media too. Um, so like if you have a, a business and you have a customer that writes a bad review on your Facebook page or things like that, how to respond to it. But overall in general, if you are dealing with people in any way, so for real estate investors, if you have tenants, um, or if you're wholesaling and you have buyers and sellers you're dealing with, this book is great because it just talks about how to deal with criticism, bad feedback, um, you know, just people that are, are giving you a hard time or anything. And it's all about kill them with kindness and how to respond and how to be proactive instead of reactive to, to, to different things. So I, I love that book if you have to interact with people at all. <laughs> So there you go, guys. That's the second step in your action plan from this episode. Go read The Simple Path to Wealth. That's by J.L. Collins. I actually had J.L. Collins on the show back on episode 41. And I believe his episode is actually coming out as a rewind episode soon. So if you hadn't heard that yet, I definitely recommend reading the book and checking it out. And then also read the Hug Your Haters book that Ashley just mentioned. I haven't read that book yet myself. I hadn't even heard of it. So I'm going to go check it out. And so to round off the action plan, Ashley, the third step is to give somebody one action item to do as soon as they're done this episode, before they go to the next podcast, before they do anything else, one action item that can help improve their life, career, or business. I'm going to say, um, because I'm very uh, real estate uh, specific, I'm going to say that to go uh, analyze a deal. So uh, Bigger Pockets has uh, calculator reports. Um, where you can, if even if you're not a pro member on their website, uh, you can you get like four times or something. You can use them for free. So just pull a deal off of the MLS. Can be any deal, just the first one that pops up, um, and then practice analyzing it. So just take the information from the MLS and plug it into the calculator. Uh, if you want to analyze it as a rental or a flip, uh, Bigger Pockets has the calculator reports for either of those and they have a rent estimator to tell you exactly what the rent would be for that property based on the location. Um, so that would be the first thing because once you you start learning and analyzing deals and you start practicing and doing it over and over again, you're gonna get so much better at your numbers. And then as you're practicing, verify those numbers. Um, Look at you know the county websites to make sure that property taxes are correct, and really get into that habit of feeling very comfortable and confident of analyzing your deals. That is a great action item. That's actually something I did when I first got started in real estate. I forced myself to analyze five deals a day every single day for six months, yeah. and I analyzed a lot of deals. And I <laughs> didn't really have interest in analyzing or purchasing any of those. I just knew that that was a habit I needed to get into. I needed to be good at it, and so I think that's a great action item for people to do before they get into their next podcast or the next book. Now, before we wrap up the show, I like to turn the tables and let the guest ask me a question. So what question do you have for me? I want to know what your long-term plan is uh, for your RV. Are you going to scale and get another one or is it just to pay this one off? What does that look like? As of right now, my plan is to scale. And so 
where you live not that far from me. We've talked about that before. I think we're just within a couple hours. So you have winter coming just like I do. And winter is not great for RVs. So I'm kind of curious to see how this first one goes throughout the winter. My guess is I'll make all of my money with the RV between April and probably October, November. And so really only you know eight months where I can make money, four months where I probably can. I think it'll still be very profitable. But so because we're going into winter, my plan is not to buy any right now. But come spring, when we get into that period of when rentals are going to start to kick up again, or even in the towards the end of winter, if I can still get a good deal on them, because sometimes winter is a good time to buy. I plan to buy at least one more, but I wouldn't be surprised if I bought two, three, four more. Um, what I love about it is you can a lot of times get them for zero down. So I could literally buy probably four of them with zero dollars out of my pocket other than insurance and registering them. So that's kind of my plan. And I know this model can work because there's actually a dealer local to me that when I got interested in this, I was looking to buy one and they just started selling them. And so I went down there and this is kind of goes back to our conversation where you just don't know where things can lead. I went down there. They had one I was interested in actually buying and I thought they were just a dealer selling them. I had no idea how big their rental business was. And so I get there and this older older lady comes out and starts talking to me and she was awesome. And to come to find out she's the owner and she's owned it for like 35 years. And for 33 of those 35 years, they've exclusively done rentals. They literally just started selling them. And so she's had a business that's done RV rentals for like 33 years. And she basically gave me this huge thick packet of like their entire playbook. She sat and talked with me for like almost two hours, just telling me everything she does. And they have probably 60 or 70 different RVs that they rent out. And she just told me that they had to buy 20 in the spring just to meet demand. And so I know it's a model that can work and be like its own business. It could be a full scale business. And, and so that's kind of my plan is to kind of work out the cobwebs or the kinks in the business model via these third party platforms like RV Share and Outdoorsy. And then once I kind of have a good grasp on how it all works, I'll buy more and then rely less on those platforms, build my own website and platform like this this other uh, bigger RV rental business has done and go direct to consumer and scale from there. And we'll see, maybe go to two, three, four, five. Who knows? We could talk at this point next year and maybe I own 20. Yeah. Um, so, and it's funny too. One, of the, one last thing I'll add is when I got into the RV thing, like you said, I did it because I saw it as a way of like RV hacking. You know, I've, I'm obsessed with this idea of buying things finding a way to make money from them and being able to use them yourself. I race motocross and you can go in just a pickup truck, but that's not a great experience. Whereas if you go in an RV, it's amazing. Like it's, it's so much better. And so I was like, all right, I got to get an RV and what can I do to make money from it? And that's the only reason I did it. I didn't think about scaling or anything like this. And I didn't think anybody else was interested in it. I thought it was just a way that I could not have to pay a mortgage every month for this, this RV. I thought it was just a good solution. Come to find out, I had like three or four of my friends. They reached out to me. They're like, oh my God, I've wanted to get into RV rentals. I'd love to buy one. Like, let's go buy one together. And now I have probably half a dozen people that want to buy them with me. And, you know, I talked to this dealership and I'm just like, this is just a business opportunity that I had never even thought was possible. And you got to so, get that um, bulk wholesale rate now, too. <laughs> yeah. But you know what's crazy, though, is they make sense even if you don't. Like, that's what's kind of yeah. cool about this is the rates are so good that. And with zero dollars down, it's an infinite cash on cash return. Right. So it's like with real estate, a lot of like work goes into really getting a smoking deal on a property under value, but you don't necessarily have to do that with an RV. And so it's interesting. Um, I think that's what's next. I think that's what I'm going to do. And we could talk in six months at the end of our, our mastermind and then my plan could be totally different. But as of right <laughs> now, that, that's the plan. Well, that's awesome. That's really exciting for you. And I think one thing that you should add to this is that you should uh, buy a self storage facility so that you can put your RVs in the winter in a couple of the units and then rent out the other units and then have a paid for self storage facility. Yeah, RVs. that's a great idea. And <laughs> there's actually it's a very another like kind of model is a lot of people pay money to store boats and yeah. cars and stuff over the winter. So you, I, I could buy this you know, there's so many opportunities by self storage, let people store things there, have my own lot for all these RVs. So yeah, that's a great idea. And um, this is just another example of how many different things you can do in real estate when you get out there, take action. You know, there's just so, so much opportunity out there. 
so many shiny objects to shake. Well, that's that's the hard part, right? Is, is which, which shiny object to, to focus on? Well, Ashley, I, I know people are going to love this episode. I know I did, and they're going to want to connect with you. So where is the best place to do that? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And anyone can find me on Instagram at Wealth From Rentals or listen to the Real Estate Rookie podcast. And I'm also on Bigger Pockets. I have a profile there if you search Ashley Care. I will put links to all Ashley's different resources in the show notes for you guys to check out. Ashley, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.